Hello, I'm Hannah Donnert with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Chandra is bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnership calls, webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's CHE webinars. It's our second webinar in the six part series, Cancer and the Environment, Science and Opportunities for Prevention. Today's webinar is titled, Carcinogen Hazards of Women's Occupational Chemical Exposures, Nitrates in Drinking Water, and Particulate Matter Composition and Air Pollution. Our moderator today is Karen Wang, Director of the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. We will leave time following the presentation for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions through the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentation. After the presentations, our moderators will read out questions, or our moderator will read out questions for our speakers to respond to. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period. For those of you who call in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone in the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 70 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Karen. Thank you so much, Hannah. Um, welcome everyone to the second webinar in our series, Cancer in the Environment, Science and Opportunities for Prevention. Before I introduce today's topic and speakers, I wanted to give you the dates and times of the rest of the webinars in our series. Um, you can find more information about these um, and the dates at our website, healthandenvironment.org. Um, there are many important topics um, and different aspects about uh, the topic cancer and the environment. So today we're going to cover occupational exposures, water and air pollution. The third webinar in our series um, is on the contribution of heavy metals, endocrine disrupting chemicals and pesticides to cancer risk and that will be on April 15th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. The fourth topic in our series is on chemical mixtures um, because uh, you know, most people are exposed to um, many of these exposures at the same time. Um, we'll be looking at uh, recent research there on May 20th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. And then our fifth webinar will be on childhood cancers on June 3rd at 10 a.m. Pacific time. And the last topic in our series will highlight work on the disproportionate impact of environmental exposures on marginalized communities and will take place on July 22nd at 10 a.m. Pacific time. So um, you can sign up for our newsletter or check our um, website for updates on those and to see the list of speakers. So turning to today, um, today's webinar is on um, the carcinogen hazards of women's occupational chemical exposures, nitrates in drinking water, and particulate matter composition in air pollution. We have three really great speakers um, and I will introduce all three of them now. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Alexandra White, who is a Stadman investigator in the epidemiology branch at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. She leads the Environment and Cancer Epidemiology Group and her research aims to identify novel and modifiable environmental risk factors for cancer. Our second speaker is Dr. Alexis Temkin, who conducts toxicology assessments of drinking water contaminants and ingredients in consumer products with the Environmental Working Group. And our third speaker is Alana Silver, who is Principal Consultant at Laurelton Research, which provides public health planning analysis and education services for clients including biotech companies, universities, community-based organizations, and government agencies. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to you, Alexandra. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you all very much for attending this webinar, and thank you for the invitation to present some of our work. So I'm gonna talk about a recent paper um, that was titled Air Pollution, Clustering of Particulate Matter Components and Breast Cancer in the Sister Study, a US-wide cohort.
Here we go. Okay, so air pollution is a worldwide public health issue. It's a ubiquitous and heterogeneous mixture, and we're exposed to air pollution from a variety of different sources, including traffic, other sources of transportation, um, sources of indoor heating and cooking, as well as industrial emissions and natural events such as wildfires. The WHO recently estimated that about 7 million deaths worldwide could be attributed to both indoor and outdoor air pollution. Air pollution is also plausible as a breast carcinogen. The International Agency for Research on Cancer has classified outdoor air pollution as a group one carcinogen, although this is primarily based on what we know about lung cancer. Um, but air pollution is a complex mixture. It contains a number of different constituents, um, including those um, with potential endocrine disrupting properties, um, such as metals and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which we would um, suspect to be um, relevant for breast cancer. We don't typically think of air pollution as being relevant for the breast, um, but we know that inhaled toxicants do reach the breast tissue as they've been measured in the breast fluid. And ecologic studies suggest that breast cancer incidence increases with traffic emission. This figure shows nitrogen oxide emissions, um, in, which is a proxy for traffic exposure. And you can see there's this rapid rise around 1955, and then there's a bit of a lag and then a parallel increase in the breast cancer incidence rates. So far, the evidence from epidemiologic studies on air pollution and breast cancer um, have been pretty inconclusive. Um, and this is probably because um, in our epidemiologic studies, we tend to measure a variety of different um, aspects or types of air pollution. And when studies measure markers of traffic, um, including NO2 and pHs, they tend to more consistently observe a positive association with breast cancer risk. Whereas there's been largely no associations observed for particulate. But particulate matter itself is a complex mixture. And for those of you that aren't familiar with particulate matter, it's a classification of particles based on size. So PM10 are particles that are less than 10 microns in diameter. And PM2.5, which is also called fine particulate matter, is defined as particles that are less than 2.5 microns. But this says nothing about what's actually making up these particles. And we know that there is um, a lot of variability in particulate matter composition um, geographically due to varying sources as well as meteorology and other factors. So the aim of our study was to estimate the association between exposure to air pollution, including PM2.5, PM10, and NO2, with breast cancer risk, and to evaluate whether these associations vary by geographic region. So our study builds off of the sister study prospective cohort, which is a study of over 50,000 women across the US and Puerto Rico. These women were recruited between 2003 and 2009, um, at which point they could be ages um, between 35 and 74. Um, and they had no history of breast cancer themselves, but they all have a sister who was diagnosed with breast cancer in order to be eligible for the study. Baseline, they complete an extensive questionnaire, um, which included questions on their residential history. The study is an active follow-up, so women um, complete annual health updates, as well as more detailed um, surveys every two to three years. Um, this is a really engaged cohort, so our response rates have been about um, over 90% throughout the follow-up period. If women are diagnosed with breast cancer, um, they um, either can call in or fill this out in one of their surveys um, and let us know, and the, um, we request access to their medical records and pathology reports um, to confirm the diagnosis. So for this analysis that I'm going to share with you today, we had over 3,000 cases um, diagnosed in the study population. Um, these cases were largely invasive cases um, and predominantly hormone receptor positive. So we assessed air pollution exposure for all um, of our participants in the sister study um, for PM2.5, PM10, and NO2 using a land use regression model with spatial smoothing and creaking. So what this means is we used, um, we took EPA monitoring data for these three um, pollutants in addition to a host of geographic covariates, including traffic emissions, industrial emissions, um, land use, um, and uh, population density, in order to estimate the annual average at the residential address um, where they lived when they enrolled in the study. Um, because of the air pollution modeling, this was limited to women in our study population who were living in the contiguous US. For our statistical analysis, we use Cox proportional hazard models to estimate hazard ratios and 95% confidence intervals for an interquartile range increase in air pollutants in relation to breast cancer risk. Um, and women were followed from their age at baseline when they enrolled in the study to the age of breast cancer diagnosis or sensory. 
And we stratified and tested for modification by the census geographic regions that are shown here in the map. Um, so these are um, defined as West, Midwest, South, and Northeast. And all the results I'm showing today were adjusted for age, race, education, smoking status, and menopausal hormone therapy. So to start, I want to give you an idea of the sister study characteristics at baseline. Um, so the average age at the time they enrolled in the study was about 55 years. Uh, about 84% of the women in our study population are non-Hispanic white. This is a volunteer cohort, so they are slightly higher SES than the general population. About half have a bachelor's degree or higher, and about a third have an annual household income greater than $100,000. And over half have been never smokers. And so for this study, we have an average of about eight years of follow-up from when they enrolled in the study. So to start, I'm gonna show our results um, for the three air pollutants, um, an IQR increase um, in relation to overall breast cancer risk. So you can see that we saw um, suggested positive association for higher um, exposure to PM2.5, um, as well as higher exposure to NO2 with overall breast cancer risk, um, but no association for PM10. So next, we broke this up by whether women were diagnosed with invasive breast cancer or DCIS, um, which is considered stage zero disease. Um, so interestingly, um, for invasive breast cancer, these associations were attenuated um, towards the null, um, and the overall effects seem to be driven by DCIS. So we observe positive associations for higher exposure to PM2.5 and NO2 in relation to DCIS. Um, we also considered whether these associations varied by hormone receptor subtype and menopausal status at diagnosis, and we didn't see a lot of variability in our associations, um, considering those different outcome classifications. So we were interested in addressing this potential for geographic heterogeneity. Um, so this, um, next I'm gonna show our results looking at these air pollution metrics and breast cancer risks stratified by those um, census geographic regions. Um, so this first um, graph I'm showing is for invasive breast cancer. And the p-values on the figure are the heterogeneity p-values. So these p-values um, for PM2.5 and PM10 are telling us that we observe significant heterogeneity in the association between um, particulate matter and breast cancer by region. So for PM2.5, we see a positive association um, for PM2.5 and breast cancer risk only among women living in the Western US. We see a similar pattern for PM10 exposure, although that association among the Western US is attenuated towards the null. And for NO2, we didn't observe significant heterogeneity, but we do see some evidence that associations were limited to women living in the Southern and Western US. So next, we looked at these same um, associations for DCIS. Um, and we have much fewer DCIS cases in the cohort, so our confidence intervals get bigger and we have less precision here. Um, but we do see some evidence of, again, this geographic heterogeneity um, for DCIS. And what's interesting to me is that the regions um, differ based on invasive or DCIS. So for example, for PM2.5, for DCIS, we observe positive associations only really among those living um, in the Northeast and the Midwest. Um, so we were able to drill down a little bit more in these PM2.5 um, geographic heterogeneity by considering PM2.5 component profiles. So the second aim of um, our study was to evaluate whether the association between PM2.5 and breast cancer risk varied um, considering PM2.5 component data. So we had information on PM2.5 components from 130 different US EPA air quality system monitoring locations. So these locations measured 22 different PM2.5 component species in 2010, and these mass concentrations um, were converted to relative composition. Um, but because it's um, important to consider these um, different components, because we're not exposed to just one at a time, and because they're highly correlated, you can't just include them all in a single model, um, we utilized um, k-means clustering, which is a dimension reduction technique. Um, that partitions multi-pollutant observations into clusters with similar patterns. So this map um, that I just um, set at the top of the screen here um, shows the 130 different EPA monitoring locations in the US that we had data from. Um, so you can see um, that we were able to identify eight different clusters using this k-means clustering approach. Um, and so this uses an algorithm to maximize the similarity within cluster and maximize the dissimilarity between clusters in order to identify um, subgroups of monitors that have similar PM2.5 component profiles. Um, so we identified eight clusters, um, but the eighth cluster was just a single site. So we moved forward with seven clusters in our analysis. 
Um, but because our study participants don't live at these individual monitor locations, our second step was to predict membership to these clusters um, based on their residential location. So this map shows um, the almost 50,000 women living in the contiguous US um, in the sister study cohort and how they were assigned um, to different PM2.5 component clusters. So this I'm showing um, the PM2.5 comp component clusters um, stratified by the census geographic regions. So what I want to show here is that while the PM2.5 component clusters are correlated with region, um, in some cases they overlap multiple um, census geographic regions, um, and in other cases, a census geographic region may contain multiple different clusters. Um, so this is a more fine um, exposure assessment um, compared to kind of this crude census region um, that we did as our first step. So when we looked at the association between PM2.5 and breast cancer by these PM2.5 um, clusters, we again saw some evidence of heterogeneity. Um, we saw no positive association um, for clusters one through three or cluster five, but among women living um, in cluster four and seven, we saw positive associations with higher exposure to PM2.5 for invasive breast cancer. Um, we did look at the association between PM2.5 and DCIS by cluster, but again, we just have a lot fewer DCIS cases. Um, so these results were really imprecise, but in general, they seemed um, to be consistent with um, the geographic regions analysis. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about clusters four and seven, where we saw these positive associations. So this map is the same map you saw before with the sister study participants and cluster four and the black dots um, primarily based in California. Um, and the cluster seven are a little bit harder to see, but it's a more diffuse um, gray dot in the Western US. And this other panel um, shows how these clusters are defined based on the PM2.5 components. So what's important to take away from this is that if the bars go to the left, um, they have relatively less of that component. And if the bars go to the right, they have um, relatively more of that component. Um, so cluster four was defined by being low in sulfur and high um, in sodium nitrate. Um, so this pattern is thought to be indicative of the marine aerosols and agricultural emissions in that region. Cluster seven tended to be high across a number of different transition elements, which is um, indicative of the surface soil in the Western US. Um, so these results are consistent um, where we see this positive association in these Western based clusters um, with our census um, geographic region stratification but we see that it um, is only really evident for these two clusters, um, four and seven. So in summary, um, we observed that air pollution exposure was associated with both DCIS and invasive breast cancer, um, but these associations vary um, by geographic region and PM2.5 component clusters. Um, most prior research really has focused on invasive breast cancer, um, and not a lot of research has really considered associations with DCIS. Um, but these, so maybe in light of that, the differences that we observed were unexpected. Um, we had a number of different sensitivity analyses um, to evaluate whether additional adjustment for socioeconomic status variables um, or screening practices might change these results. Um, but this population, they all have a family history of breast cancer, um, so they tend to be very highly screened. Um, and these really, um, none of these sensitivity analyses changed our results. So it's possible that air pollution mixtures may contribute differently to breast cancer risk by stage of disease, um, potentially influencing tumor growth rates. Um, one prior study did, that did look at DCIS um, was the Long Island Breast Cancer Study Project, which is a case control study out of Long Island, New York. And they observed a stronger association using a pH-based traffic model um, for DCIS compared to invasive. Um, and this is a similar geographic region um, where we observed a positive association for DCIS. Our results would be um, consistent with that. In terms of generalizability, um, this is predominantly a population of white women. Um, we know that um, black women tend to live in areas of higher exposure to air pollution, so more work is needed um, in other more diverse populations. Um, and all the women in our cohort do have a family history of breast cancer. Um, so we can't rule out the fact that these findings might not be generalizable to all women. Um, but I want to end by talking a little bit about some of the innovations of our study. Um, this was the first study to consider PM2.5 components using a mixtures approach. Um, as I mentioned, we know that we're not exposed, exposed just to one type of PM2.5 components, um, that these often come um, correlated together. And air pollution is a really complex mixture, and it's important to address that heterogeneity. 
Um, and using this k-means clustering approach um, was a novel application of this method um, considering these correlated components. Um, this was an unsupervised approach, meaning that breast cancer was not um, included in the prediction algorithm for the clusters. Um, so it's possible that there could be other groups or combinations of pollutants that are more strongly related to breast cancer risk that we didn't identify here. And rather what we identified was our clusters were the most um, prominent ones. So previous research that's observed a null association for overall PM and breast cancer risk um, may have been masking over a lot of heterogeneity and exposure. Because overall, we didn't really see anything. It was only when we stratified by region and then by clusters that we were able to detect um, association. So with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators on this research, and I've also included the citation here for the paper. Thank you all very much for your time. Oh, and to end, I would like to note that I am hiring a postdoc. So if you found um, this research interesting or you know someone who's looking for a postdoc, have them email me. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Alexander. Um, we're going to wait here for Alexis to pull up her slides now. Um, while we're waiting, if you guys want to, if you all want to put in uh, questions into the question answer box, that would be great. And we can get to them at the end of the webinar. Alexis, we'll let you take it away. Here you are. Great, thank you so much for having me to talk about um, some of our drinking water research that we've been working on. So the data that I'll talk about today, we published in a paper in June that's open access and available. And I'll be talking about um, our focus on assessment of economic evaluation and cancer risk due to nitrate in US drinking water. So there was also an adverse birth outcomes component to this research, um, but in the interest of time and topic subject matter, I'm just gonna stick to cancer risk, but that is in the paper. So nitrate in drinking water um, was sort of first recognized as a health concern in the early 1960s where elevated levels of nitrate were could cause harm to infants in the form of methemoglobinemia or blue baby syndrome. And this is still really used as the critical health effect in deriving uh, legal standards for nitrate in drinking water. But really since the 1990s, there have been other health concerns identified, primarily increases in cancer risk, as well as some adverse pregnancy outcomes. And nitrate in drinking water is particularly a problem in agricultural areas due to application of nitrogen-based fertilizers and runoff from um, farming practices in animal areas. So there's, there's about 44 billion pounds of nitrate fertilizer applied each year. And this is a satellite image of a town called Pretty Prairie in Kansas. And you can see that it's sort of surrounded by this multi-use farmland. So there's a lot of wheat, corn, soybeans grown in this area, and they suffer from some of the highest nitrate levels in the country. They've really, over the last 20 years, have been consistently in violation of the EPA limit. And so typically excessive nitrate levels really affect these small rural communities without the resources to install treatment options. And while this is a bit of a extreme case of nitrate contamination, I wanted to give you a picture of what contamination looks like on a national level. So EWG has been collecting information on nitrate as well as other drinking water contaminants in tap water since about 2010 for 48,000 public water system in the country. And these data that I'm showing here represent the population served by public water systems with average nitrate concentrations in these different brackets um, between the years of 2010 and 2017. And so, you know, if you look all the way on the right where you see greater than 10, that's the current legal standard for nitrate. There aren't many people, you know, experiencing levels exceeding that standard. But when you look at the average nitrate levels greater than one, for instance, there's about 80 million people um, that are served drinking water currently above one milligram per liter. And I'll talk about why that might be important um, in a minute. And to give you an idea of sort of where these systems are, these are dots for public water systems that have nitrate concentrations above one milligram per liter in their drinking water. Um, and you can see they are in a lot of agricultural areas as well as sort of dispersed through the US. 
So for our research question, given our ability to sort of assess nitrate exposure throughout drinking water in the US, we wanted to try and assess and we're curious what the potential public health costs of current nitrate contamination in US drinking water might be. And so in thinking about what those public health impacts were that we wanted to investigate, as I mentioned, the evidence in the literature really points to an increased cancer risk associated with nitrate, particularly colorectal cancer. And so these are data published from a study published last year in Denmark, where the authors assessed nitrate in drinking water and colorectal cancer risk for the entire country. So this includes over 1.7 million people. And what they found was a significant increased risk at very low levels of nitrate, just under one mg per, mg per liter and just over two mg per liter, um, as well as some evidence of a dose response. And to summarize some of the other studies here, um, there was another large study in Spain and Italy, which identified a nearly 50% increase um, in colorectal cancer risk at levels just above 1.7 milligrams per liter. Um, and noting that both of these studies controlled for several confounding factors, including diet and physical activity. There's also been areas um, in Iowa, in the US, where we've studied, um, there's been an ongoing cohort looking at cancer risk, and they've identified colorectal cancer as well as some other cancer sites as being um, potentially associated with nitrate in drinking water. Um, and the reason I've identified and sort of listed these studies here is that these were different exposure and risk scenarios that we used in order to calculate our estimated nitrate attributable cancer cases. So a little bit on our methodology for how we did that. There was um, a paper published in 2010 where they did this type of analysis for the European Union and we based our assessment with slight modifications on the methodology that they used, where essentially what we're trying to answer is what proportion of the colorectal cancer cases that are currently occurring could be due to nitrate. And so to do that, we looked at the increased risk in the population exposed and the baseline national incidence to get an idea of what those nitrate attributable cancer cases were. So as I mentioned, we have this sort of nationwide exposure data where the population exposed was estimated to be the number of people exposed above a given nitrate cutoff level. And those were where we took the um, exposure estimates from our epidemiological data. And then the increased risk similarly were those relative risk values that were reported in the studies. And then the baseline incidence that we used was the national incidence um, as reported by the CDC over um, between 2011 and 2015. We also did an interesting estimate for non-community water systems and small community water systems where we used the exposure estimates in those types of systems to help serve as a proxy for what the private well cancer risk might be or what the exposure to private wells might be. And so what we found from our different exposure scenarios was that for colorectal cancer, we had an estimated minimum of just over 1,200 cancer cases, and our maximum was up to about 10,000 uh, annual nitrate attributable cancer cases. And to give you an idea of how that compares to what the total cancer cases for colorectal cancer are in the US, this is about one to 8% of the total colorectal cancer cases. And that's similar to what the results were in Europe. They estimated that about 4% of the colon cancer cases could be due to nitrate in drinking water. And similarly, this is sort of a breakdown. If you look at all these different types of cancer sites together, we estimated that there is about 12,594 nitrate attributable cancer cases as our maximum estimate. And in thinking about this sort of one to 8% um, attributable over total cancer cases, it may seem like a small sort of um, contribution compared to other risk factors, but I want to emphasize that um, these estimated cases can come from involuntary exposure in terms of this contaminant being present in your drinking water source. So then what we did was took this research um, to see where these cases were coming from and how the risk might differ in different areas. 
So to generate sort of this um, estimated attributable cancer cases per 100,000 people, we took our raw um, number of cases and divided them by the state population. And what we see is that areas like California, Delaware, and Arizona, and Iowa have some of the highest risk. And in general, this correlates really well to the average nitrate concentration. So for instance, Delaware, the average concentration is around three milligrams per liter. Um, and that this in general sort of falls where we see the highest nitrate levels in drinking water, which would be expected. And so the next part was then to take these estimated cancer cases and do an economic analysis associated with them. And we did this in two different ways. We looked at direct med medical costs. So this is essentially costs that are coming from cancer cases that we estimated based on um, medical care that's required and typically over how long people suffer from those cases, um, when they're diagnosed throughout while they have the disease, and then generally in the last year of life. And then the other is this idea of indirect economic loss where um, we use these calculations called dailies um, or disability adjusted life years, which take into consideration um, how long you've lived with the disease and what sort of economic indirect costs sort of due to productivity um, you might be suffering or experiencing and use that as a value of a life year. So as I mentioned, these, these dailies are disability adjusted life years and you get that through calculating um, years of life lost based on your average life expectancy and the median age death for the disease, um, as well as the years lived with disease. And similarly, what we found based on our minimum and maximum estimates of our cancer cases was really that basically for colorectal cancer in direct medical costs, we saw just about over a billion dollars. And then in the range of indirect economic loss at the maximum, we saw just under $5 billion. Similarly, these vary depending on cancer cases, um, the amount of cost for each of those cancer types, um, as well as the total estimated number of cancer cases. And then the third part of this analysis was to do a meta-analysis of colorectal cancer risk and nitrate in drinking water to begin to sort of investigate the dose response function of this exposure. So I think sort of based on the quality of the studies and the weight of evidence that has come out in the last few years really enabled this um, type of analysis to be done, whereas I think it would have been a bit premature to do this um, probably even just five years ago. And so what we did was we looked at eight different studies assessing nitrate in drinking water and colorectal cancer risk. And we did a general least squares regression analysis on each study, and then a meta-analysis of the slope coefficients. And so what you can see is each study listed on the left, um, the estimated risk um, based on the bars and the 95% confidence interval, and then the central estimate of the slight yet significant increase in risk associated with colorectal cancer and nitrate in drinking water. So just to summarize, we saw that about 2,300 to 12,500 cancer cases could be attributable to nitrate um, in drinking water in the US. And that's about 50, 54 to 82% of those were estimated to be colorectal cancer cases, which is where we see the strongest data. Um, the states with estimated greater than 10 nitrate attributable cancer cases per 100,000 people were areas like Delaware, Arizona, California, and Iowa. And our meta-analysis of eight studies found a statistically significant linear positive association with nitrate in drinking water and colorectal cancer risk. Um, and so really, in terms of implications, um, this is providing data, I think, to support that there are potentially substantial public health impacts happening at current nitrate levels in tap water. And so I just wanted to thank um, co-authors and colleagues um, at EWG, as well as um, an intern who worked really hard on this paper and this work. 
Um, and so thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Alexis, for your presentation. We'll be moving on shortly to Alana's presentation. Um, she'll be pulling up her slides. And in the meantime, feel free to put in any questions you may have in the Q&A box. Uh, and we will let Alana take, take the microphone from here. Okay, great, thank you so much. Um, really happy to be here as part of this series. I'm gonna be talking about a study we call the WORK study, stands for the Women's Occupations and Risk from Chemicals. And so this study was uh, funded by the California Breast Cancer Research Program. It's led by Dr. Robert Harrison, who's an occupational health physician at the Occupational Health Branch of the California Department of Public Health. And as well, he's got an appointment at the University of California, San Francisco. And the other leader of the study is Dr. Peggy Reynolds, an epidemiologist also at UCSF. And the goal of the study is to advance our understanding of the de degree to which workplace chemical exposures may increase breast cancer risk among California working women. It's a five year project with three phases. And what I'm gonna talk about today is the first two phases of the project. So in the first phase, we collected all the available data we could find to answer these questions. And then in the second phase, we uh, generated some of our own data and built the data, data visualization tool that I'll talk about um, there's a link to the tool below. I will be showing screenshots of the tool and also doing a demo, but if you want to follow along at home, you can with this link. The third phase of the project is still going on now and I won't really talk about, but you can see in the picture, it's going to be a study of uh, occupational exposures among cleaners, women working as housekeepers and cleaners. The reasons why we developed the tool were to make the chemical exposure hazards faced by working women more visible. And specifically, we were interested in the breast cancer hazards. There's been a lot of research in occupational health. A lot of it focuses on men. Um, and so we really wanted to make the hazards for women and for breast cancer chemicals of concern visible. And we also wanted to point to the key data gaps in understanding occupational exposures to breast carcinogens in California. Uh, some of our goals we couldn't fully achieve. Uh, we were hoping to point to industries in California that appear to pose the greatest breast cancer risk. I think what I'm going to show today kind of starts to answer that question, but doesn't fully. Uh, similarly, we wanted to be able to let users explore differences in exposures based on certain demographic markers. And we did collect data on all these markers I'll talk about, but only two of them are included in the data visualization tool, which is was too much data to include otherwise, so that that's race and age. And so I'm going to talk you through our methods. The first thing we did was try to answer the question, where do women work in California? So we reviewed a variety of data sources and we identified the American Community Survey, ACS. That's the data from the US Census and that was the best source of information. So we used the data set from 2010 to 2014. Uh, this data set includes about 15 million women aged 16 and over in California, and we focused our analysis on the women that were currently working. We found that about 43% of the 15 million women in California are not in the labor force and 6% were unemployed, so we focused on the 7.7 .7 million who are currently working. We collected data on all the industries that the women worked in those uh, and all the occupations. Um, we found about 500 occupations. And we included all the socio-demographic characteristics that we thought we'd be interested in looking at, include, including age, race and ethnicity, education, income, citizenship, language spoken at home, and presence and age of children in the home. And so this is a screenshot from the tool. And what I wanted to show here on the left side is the list of occupations from the ACS and the number of women in each occupation listed underneath. And the Bubbles or half moons, as we call them in, in salmon color here, represent the number of women in each of the ethnicity categories. You can also toggle to, to age to see blue bubbles or half moons uh, that show the age distribution. And I'll show more in the demo, but you can sort and filter and to get more information about all of these things. The second goal of the project was to identify chemicals of concern for breast cancer. We identified multiple, we evaluated multiple data sources. And in the end, we used the list from the Silent Spring Institute, the list of mammary gland carcinogens and mammary gland toxicants, and TEDx, the endocrine disruption exchange, list of endocrine disruptors because we know breast cancer is hormonally mediated. 
we ended up with a list of over a thousand chemicals of concern for breast cancer. And we created indicators for the different characteristics that I just talked about, as well as high production volume chemicals. Those are chemicals that are 500 tons or more of them are used or imported into the US each year. And these chemicals were categorized into 27 groups based on chemical properties and usage. Um, we did also construct another data set which had some um, sampling data from OSHA, the data by industry and chemicals, but it was very sparse and very old. There wasn't a lot of data there. And what this shows is the results of the chemicals of concern analysis on the right. You see the list of the 27 categories and the over a thousand chemicals of concern. It shows the number of chemicals in each category. And on the left, uh, a Venn diagram showing the different attributes of the chemicals. And this is another view of the data visualization tool. If you click on explore chemicals at the top, it takes you to this page. And so there's a little card for each category of chemicals. It includes the Venn diagram again, the number of chemicals in the category, the number of women potentially exposed, and you can sort by, by any of those. And so now I'll talk about how we got to that number of women exposed. To estimate the chemical exposures among workers, we used a job exposure matrix approach to, to identify which occupations potentially have exposures to the categories of chemicals of concern. We had two industrial hygienists go through the list of occupations and score them each for each category of chemicals, whether they have probable, possible, or unlikely exposure to that chemical. The two industrial hygienists worked completely independently and in the areas where they disagreed, we had a third reviewer, an occupational medicine physician go through and most of them were able to be resolved in that way. And some, when all three of them disagreed, then we they have a discussion process to come up with a consensus answer. I had mentioned that there were 500 occupations in the data set but that was just too many to go through this process with. So in the end, there were 145 occupations included in the analysis and in the data visualization tool. We prioritized first occupations that employ a large number of women, so the top 80% of the workforce. We included all of those occupations. Then for the remaining occupations, we had a process of going through them, the subject matter experts look through them, and any that uh, employed over 1,000 workers and that we thought might potentially have exposures of concern, we included in the, in the gem as well. Uh, another goal of ours in putting this together was to make sure that informal workers were visible in the tool. Uh, these are jobs that do not show up in formal data sources and that operate outside of established labor laws. So there might be higher risk of exposure because of being outside of established labor laws. Maybe they're not using the same personal protective equipment. Maybe they have limited literacy or limited English skills. So that, that was one of the reasons we wanted to focus on, on that workforce. But what we found is that we really couldn't get any reliable data on the numbers of informal workers, either by industry or occupation. We did use several methods to try to assess this and they'll be described. We have a publication we just submitted. So there'll be more details on that there. But in the end, for the data visualization tool, we ended up using the number of self-employed women in the American Community Survey data as a proxy. And so I say here, interpret with caution, because we wanted to show the numbers, but we know that they're not that accurate. And so to address that, we, we did a second approach to find out more about the informal workers. And we had a process of working with our advisory committee to come up with a list of workforces that we thought were likely to employ substantial numbers of informal workers in California. And so we came up with these nine lists of workforces, which we then mapped back to the ACS occupation categories to come up with a list of occupations that we thought were likely to have a substantial informal workforce. And then we did the job exposure matrix assessment for them, and you can, you can view their results in the data visualization tool as well. And so that's my cue to go into the demo part. And so this is the same screen we saw before. And like I was saying, you can click on this on the headings if you wanted to know which occupations employ the largest number of Asian women. By clicking on that, it's sorted by the number of women. 
So you can see registered nurses, accountants, and auditors. Those are some of the occupations that pop up. You can also just sort, sort the list of occupations alphabetically, or you can filter, search for an occupation you're interested in. And then you can toggle to the age button as well. So if you wanted to know which occupations employ large numbers of young women, by clicking here, you'd, you'd see that list ordered by, by the age. Next, I'll show you the chemical page that we looked at before. Here it is. And again, you can sort if you wanna know which categories have the largest number of women potentially exposed or the largest number of chemicals. You can see that. And you can click on any one of these cards to get more information about the chemicals. Um, the dancing bubbles here, uh, if you hover on them, they show you the different workers. So this shows you for pesticides, the number of women and which occupations they work in who have probable exposure to pesticides, which occupations have possible exposures to pesticides, what is the ethnic distribution, what is the age distribution of, of the, women's with the, the women with these exposures, combining probable and possible exposure. There's more information about the informal workers and what occupations they work in. And then there's also the Venn diagram I showed before, links to more information, and a full list of all the chemicals included in the category and the attributes of those chemicals. So let's look in more detail at an occupation, you know, pick retail salespersons. This shows the results of the job exposure matrix analysis. And so you can see that the occupation, for the occupation retail salesperson, the categories that have probable exposure are fragrance ingredients, possible exposure, some of these other chemicals. And here's also where the data on the informal workers is, is really shown. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you from a different, uh, different place. So let's say we want to look at registered nurses. It tells you here that using the self-employed women as a proxy, there were 2,500 informal workers. But we don't really think that there's a substantial body of informal workers working as registered nurses. And so that's what this represents when it shows you here that exposure data is not available. That means that we didn't think that there was a, a large number of informal workers. Same thing for teachers and cashiers. But we can get to some occupations that do have, we do think have informal workers like maids and housekeeping cleaners. You click here on their bar, it shows you the exposures for formal workers and in a different tab, the exposures expected among informal workers. With that, I'm gonna go back to my slides. And talk about some of the key findings of the study. So we did construct this database of chemicals of concern for breast cancer and occupations that employ many women in California. And we found substantial numbers of women exposed among working women in California. We found over 1 million at risk for exposures to industrial chemicals, over 2 million at risk for exposures to antimicrobials, over 4 million at risk for exposure to phthalates. Uh, and this is exposures on the job. So it's above and beyond environmental exposures that we all have every day. We found that the US census data was pretty good for temp tracking contemporary workplaces, occupations, and industries. Uh, we did find that the grouping of occupations wasn't optimal for our purposes. It ended up collapsing some occupations into one category where we thought the different occupations might have different exposures. Um, there was also the lack of information on informal workers. Uh, also, there was a lack of information about occupation history. So for things where chronic exposures are important or exposures during critical times of susceptibility, we, we weren't really able to capture that. Uh, finally, we found a really large lack of systematically collected quantitative chemical exposure data. Uh, this is to the extent that there is data, it's old and it's limited to certain industries. And so we really didn't find anything that represented current employment patterns employing large numbers of women in industries and occupations that employ a large number of women and especially informal women. 
and also a big lack of data about chemicals of concern for breast cancer, especially endocrine disrupting chemicals. The tool, we really designed it for a lay audience. That was always the point. And so we were hoping people who were stakeholders in the breast cancer world or in the workplace would use the tool. People at community-based organizations or workers, worker centers and unions. Um, but beyond that, we were all researchers ourselves, the people who developed the tool. And so we, we also thought a lot about how we hope the tool could be used by other researchers and policymakers. Uh, one area is to prioritize occupations and industries for targeted exposure surveillance and future health studies or biomonitoring. Um, another area was to continue and enhance statewide surveys. So some surveys like NHANES and the National Health Interview Survey are already collecting detailed uh, occupation and industry data. Others like BRFSS and CHIS have, have some data, but not always and not over all time. So, you know, we hope that that data can continue to be collected and maybe even expanded to include more about informal workers, more about health outcomes. Um, also projects that are doing biomonitoring like the California Biomonitoring Program, we'd hope could include more occupational health cohorts. And so we're hoping people will use the tool in, in ways like that. Um, the, like I said, the data set underlying the t tool is available, so you can contact me. I have my information here, and you can also use the Contact Us button on the tool itself. But we do want feedback. We want to know how, how people can use this tool. And um, I'll end by showing the people who, who worked on this project. The Work Advisory Committee really helped us to fill knowledge gaps and connect us to workers, and especially around identifying the informal workforce. They were invaluable in helping us come up with that list. The tool was developed by a firm, a data visualization firm called Periscopic. Their motto is do good with data. And they're based in Portland, Oregon. And finally, this is all the list of the people who worked on the project, people at the California Department of Public Health, at UCSF, and at Public Health Institute. So I want to thank them all very much for the work, and thank you all for, for having us here today. Great. Thank you so much, Alana. We're going to pass this off now to Karen. Karen's going to start asking some questions. Great. Um, thank you so much. Alana, we'll start with you. Um, we had uh, one question. Did you... Um, take into account personal protective equipment or were you able to sort of measure um, if um, that was used? And then also there was a follow-up question, you know, what are your plans to disseminate it to the groups of workers who it's relevant to? Um, and are there plans to make it in other languages to make it more accessible? Okay. So to the first, yes, I think the work, the industrial hygienists were considering what personal protective equipment would be used in a, in a standard way, but uh, I'm sure it varies among different workplaces and there was no direct measuring of whether people were using it. Um, in terms of dissemination, we're, we're trying to spread the word. We're trying to do webinars like this and, um, you know, be included in newsletters and we have our advisory committee connecting us to groups of workers. So we're trying to, to make sure that the people who helped us develop it are, are also getting to see the results and spreading it to the people they work with. Uh, there's not currently any plans to extend it to other languages. There is a possibility to um, update the data, uh, but again, we don't currently have plans for other languages. Okay, great. Um, we have here a question for Alexis. Um, Alexis, you indicated that Iowans had higher um, red meat intake along with nitrate in drinking water. How much did their meat intake vary from other states with elevated nitrate in drinking water and higher um, colon cancer rates? Um, somebody else also um, had a question about um, nitrates um, used in um, preserved meat products like bacon and, um, and was, were those sources also taken into account in your study? Yeah, those are great questions. So um, the main mechanism for the way that nitrate um, is hypothesized to cause cancer from drinking water as well from ingestion primarily through meat is through this conversion of nitrate to carcinogenic and nitroso compounds. And this is a 
process known as endogenous nitrization. And we know that in consumption of meat that this process is increased. So often in a lot of the epidemiological studies, when you look at the nitrate in drinking water, some of the things they'll control for is meat consumption or other ways that this nitrization process could occur. So what I was indicating on the slide was that the elevated cancer risk was actually observed in people who had high above median meat consumption. And that was has been observed in a couple other studies. So in the case where we were doing the estimates, if for instance, the relative risk came from a population where they were just in above median meat consumers, what we did was have the exposed population to sort of account for it being just that above median number of consumers. So we adjusted the population exposed if the risk was just coming um, from the high meat consumers that were estimated in the you know, epidemiological studies we were using for our data. Okay, great. Um, we had another question for you, Alexis, just kind of following up. The incidences for colon cancer, um, especially among those under age 50, has been rising. Um, do you think that, you know, your research, you know, addressed uh, the rising incidence there, or did you look at different age groups? Yeah, that's a great, a great question. So I've seen those statistics as well, and I think they're super fascinating um, in terms of identifying the reason why or potential risk factors um, that could be contributing to that. And, you know, it's possible that, that further research, I think, on those particular age groups might identify different risk factors that could be environmentally based. Um, in our analysis, we just looked at general population and used sort of the total incidence rate. We didn't look at any age adjusted rates, um, but that would be super interesting to do um, in further studies, I think. Okay, and then one more question for you, Alexis. Um, did you take into, you mentioned private wells, um, but could you talk a little bit more about how they were treating your study, um, considering that many go untested and um, they might have higher levels of nitrates? Yeah, so private wells is definitely a place where understanding the exposures and the levels of nitrates in those areas where we definitely need a lot more data. But because we know, you know, um, I think about 40 million Americans are on private wells, we wanted to try and incorporate them into our uh, cancer case estimates. So what we used were um, the average levels of nitrate in small community water systems and looked at sort of that distribution of average nitrate and applied it to the populations of people on private well in those states. And we compared it to USGS data that looked at groundwater nitrate contamination as sort of a proxy. Um, it's definitely a place that can be improved, um, but was one of the ways we wanted to try and bring in that population because we know they're um, important in terms of exposure. And then um, just one quick follow-up question. Uh, how do people filter nitrates from tap water? Yeah, so nitrate is, unfortunately, it can't be removed by carbon activated filter. Ion exchange is really the type of uh, water filter that, use, that can remove nitrate. Um, one of the things we really talk about in terms of preventing nitrate exposure in drinking water is through source water protection um, and really preventing it from getting into the groundwater lakes and streams in the first place. Because once it's there, it's, it is one of the contaminants that's harder to remove um, at the utility level and then also at the, um, you know, at people's individual homes. Okay, great. Um, Alexandra, we have a question for you. Um, what prompted you to study um, PM, particulate matter, association with breast cancer? And are there other associations in the literature between particulate matter and other cancers? Yeah, so I think the evidence is clearly strongest for um, particulate matter and lung cancer. And I'm not an expert, but I think that there are associations that have been observed with bladder cancer, um, liver cancer, um, as well as breast. Um, and I kind of alluded to early in my talk, but I think that one of the reasons that this is you know, important to consider for breast cancer is because many of the constituents of air pollution have been shown to act as endocrine disruptors, um, which we know is an important pathway for breast cancer. 
Okay, great. Um, another question for you. Did you consider combinations of contaminants um, in such emissions like diesel and ozone emissions? Um, and then kind of a follow-up question on that. How do you, you think, um, based on your study, um, how do you think chemical interactions could be better studied in the future? Those are great questions. So um, we did not um, include ozone. That's something we're going to do moving forward. And um, diesel also is not something that was, um, you know, incorporated in our land use regression modeling. I think that that is a really important air pollution exposure source for breast cancer, but it's something that we didn't have good nationwide data on at this point um, that we could use in the sister study. Um, I think that, you know, moving forward, I know I'm really excited that you guys are doing a webinar on chemical mixtures. It's one of my um, main areas of interest and, you know, it's relevant to air pollution as well. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of methods that are being proposed and, you know, our toolbox for addressing these questions is getting bigger. Uh, and I think that the most important thing that we can do is be really clear about, you know, what question we're trying to answer um, when we're looking at combinations of chemicals. If we're interested in, for example, in our talk, the talk I gave today, we we're interested in different, um, you know, patterns that might be relevant to our outcome of interest. Um, but I think that, you know, there are other instances where you might be interested in interactions um, or, you know, overall mixtures effect. And so I think being really clear in our questions and picking the right method that addresses that question um, is going to be kind of our way forward um, in mixtures research. Okay, great. Um, Alana, we have um, one more question for you. Um, what follow-up studies are being done based on um, the data that you guys have collected? Are you, are you guys directly doing any yourself? Yes. Uh, so the, the one study that we are doing now as a follow-up is a pilot study of women working as cleaners, both in hotels, hotel housekeepers, as well as domestic home housekeepers. Uh, we picked it in part because of the, the chemical exposures that I showed. There were quite a few categories with um, probable exposures in that occupation. And also we expect that there's a large informal workforce. So our industrial hygienists are following some cleaners around and watching them do their work and deciding which chemicals to measure for. And then we will be measuring for some chemicals as well. But it's, it's a pretty small pilot project. Okay, great. Um, let's see. I think, Alexis, there was one small follow-up question for you. What is the name of the program that assesses the cost of a particular cancer? Or, or how did you estimate that? Yeah, we took it from, there was um, a peer-reviewed paper that we used that I believe was probably published from um, CDC estimates. I can definitely find it and um, add it to some of the resources uh, that I know are posted on the website for the webinars. Okay, great. Let's see. Um, I think that's all the questions that we have. Um, so Hannah, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Karen. Um, great having all of you on today. We're approaching the end of our webinar today. A video recording will be available on Shay's website soon, and tomorrow you'll receive an email containing a link to the video. The next CHE EDC Strategies Partnership webinar will take place March 24th and is titled Understanding BPA Levels, the Need for Reanalysis of Population Data and a Reassessment of Risk is Urgent. To learn more and to RSVP, please visit our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming events or more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website at healthandenvironment.org. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars, bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank our speakers, Alana, Alexis, and Alexandra for taking time today to present, and to you, Karen, for your excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us, and have a great day.